patients. And I, um, not sure, I, I think someone has my slide presentation. If they do, could they uh, uh, put that up? Um, so I'm going to skip uh, most of it <laughs> because of the time on and respect your time. I was going to uh, give you a little bit of background from the early days of our work on developing the UN declaration and then uh, give you some highlight sections of the declaration itself and um, um, how to implement it and then so on. So if you just go on to the next slide, I'll, um, I'll follow that next one. I usually use this visual as an eagle uh, flying where we say that our rights, our uh, treaty rights in my case are on one wing and the UN declaration are on the other wing. And it takes both wings to um, work together for the eagle to fly. In other words, for our rights uh, to have the ability to soar. And if you go to the next screen, you'll see the initial uh, warriors in 1923, Chief Deskahe went to the League of Nations and he was not allowed in. Uh, two years later, a Maori leader, Ratani, Ratana, he went as well, and he couldn't get an audience. Chief Douglas from the uh, British Columbia uh, Treaty Territory. These three men went early. They were uh, our forerunners to the League of Nations, trying to get us a voice at the United Nations. And of course, uh, they were not allowed in. Chief Deskahe, unfortunately, had an audience with the, uh, the mayor of the um, city of uh, Geneva and was able to at least begin a discussion. In 1948, the next slide, you'll see a Canadian who was very instrumental in drafting the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. However, from 1923 to 1948, we had absolutely no voice at the UN or the international arena. Neither did we have a voice in 1948 because no one represented us. We weren't allowed to represent ourselves. So it was not till 1977, next slide please, till we um, actually um, had a, a, a walk, a peaceful walk into the UN. And this was the beginning of the journey. Uh, not directly at the UN at first, it was at the ILO, the International Labor Organization, uh, where we started. And they told us that we cannot discuss civil and political rights in this arena. This is for labor, economic, social, and cultural rights. So for you to discuss right to self-determination, for example, you have to go to the UN. So off to the UN we went. And fortunately, as great spirit works in wonderful ways, there happened to be a meeting at the UN on uh, uh, dispossession of lands uh, of indigenous peoples and discrimination. So we went to that meeting again, only to find out that we cannot uh, take the floor unless you're a non-governmental organization. So we had to borrow uh, uh, accreditation from people so that we could speak. So this was in 1977. And the picture you see there is a reenactment 25 years later. In 77, about 150 of us from, the, from all over the world gathered at the UN. And unfortunately, when we had our 25th year reunion, there were only uh, 13, I believe, that came back. <clears throat> so if you're gonna, talk about the declaration, that's where it starts. And if you want to quickly just skim through the slides, I'm not, not going to uh, go through the slides. What I will say at this point here though, is that it was finally adopted on September 13, 2007, which meant that we took um, 25 years to get the, the declaration passed at the UN. Now, this is um, um, a picture of the, the first walk in that you see. 
on the screen now, I hope, where we had our elders lead us into the UN uh, with uh, four pipes and um, began the debates on the rights of indigenous peoples. We did have a, a uh, declaration that we had drafted, uh, but it was uh, rejected, of course. So the UN finally, after 25 years, um, adopted this declaration and you'll see there's the foundational rights. Um, Article three, of course, is the, uh, um, the right of self-determination, but on a screen, you'll see the most fundamental right uh, for us in our language, which means inherent rights. You're born with these rights. You don't ask anybody else to give them to you. So the UN uh, thought different. Next slide, please. Um, and you'll see that, uh, that the right to self-determination um, is the, oops, okay. I'll, I'll skip all these slides. It's okay, stay there. Because this was the other topic I was asked to speak about anyway, uh, was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how, uh, how uh, it uh, impacted uh, education and the promoted and advanced reconciliation uh, in Canada. So if you uh, go to the next slide, you'll see the beginning of the uh, um, Truth Commission. Uh, let me give you a little background, first of all, on the Truth Commission. Uh, some 13,000 students former students of what was called the Indian Residential School Policy uh, decided they had had enough and decided to sue the governments and the churches. And of course, with uh, 13,000 lawsuits, the um, uh, judges in their wisdom asked if there could be a settlement out of court. And if you flick the next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, we skipped all of them. Okay, I'll stop. This was the end of it. This is the end of it. Um, this is my school. I spent 13, 14 years in residential school. The policy by law was you were to be separated from your parents and put into these institutions uh, for 10 months out of the year sometimes. Uh, some students couldn't go home. The law said you were to be taken from your parents when you were 17. That didn't happen with me. I was taken when I was 16 and um, lived in this building for uh, 11 years. So the first thing that happens to you when you enter this building is your name is taken. And anything culturally relevant, like your clothing, if you have braids, your braids were cut off, your clothing was taken, including your name. So my name is Mahigan Mohteo. In English, my English given name was Wilton Littlechild. But my residential school name for the rest, the rest of these years was number 65. 65, pick up that pen, you stupid. Or 65, you idiot, why did you do that? 65, come here. So you ask yourself, what happens to a child when you take them away from their parents and you take this, their name from them and anything culturally relevant to them? What happens to the parents from whom you've removed the children? This school that you see on the top floor is where the nuns used to live that ran the school. It was run by a Catholic church. The second floor is where the girls' dorm was. The third floor is the uh, uh, classrooms. And the ground floor is the dining hall. In the middle building, you'll see the boys' dorm. Uh, the big boys, middle boys, and little boys separated. And at the back, you'll see there's a horse barn, there's a cow barn, there's a chicken coop and there's a hog barn. So as children, 
we basically uh, took care of ourselves. We looked after ourselves. So when I was appointed as a commissioner, uh, the, the most unique truth and reconciliation commission in the world, uh, unique because it's the first time it was court ordered uh, as a commission because of the 13,000 lawsuits. But the survivors in their wisdom said, if we settle out of court, we're gonna lose a chance to tell our story. So we want a truth commission established so that the world will know, or Canada at least will know what happened to us as children, what happened to our parents and what happened to the children that came behind. So um, we set up a commission a truth commission with a mandate to have seven national events to hold public events across Canada. And uh, um, use um, a cultural approach. Luckily, we were very fortunate because we went to some elders who had gone to residential school and we asked them, how should we do this work? And they said, well, you should actually um, um, look at our sacred teachings, look at our sacred teachings. And um, I'm trying to find the slides here so I can show you, but um, or if you go to the next slide, maybe you'll see. No, keep going, please. No, keep going. I'm trying to cut down time here. No, oh, you're at the end. I'm sorry. This this is not the right slide uh, um, presentation that was supposed to be shown. But in any event, we had 7,000 witnesses come to our uh, hearings. And I have to say that um, you wouldn't wanna go through that process of listening to children that were abused physically and mentally, spiritually, culturally, and worst of all, sexual abuse. Thousands and thousands of children told us about their horrific, horrific experience in these schools, uh, including myself. I didn't want to do this job to begin with. I didn't really know why I didn't, but once I started hearing the stories, what was happening to me was I was hearing my own life story being told in front of me. So it was very, very, uh, emotionally difficult to hear all these sexual abuse stories, punishment. So when we asked the survivors, how should we go about our work? They said, since the courts has ordered uh, seven national events, let's take our sacred teachings and use them as themes for our national hearings. The first sacred teaching of course is respect. And in Winnipeg, when we had our first national event, uh, 40,000 people came and the theme was respect. And then we went up north, far north for the second event and the theme was courage. It takes a lot of courage to survive and live in the north to begin with. So that was an, uh, an appropriate uh, theme. The third one, the third teaching I thought would be very, very difficult. Um, because um, it was about love, the theme was love. And many, many, many times we heard stories from children or adults that, uh, in their children's voice going back. I don't know anything about love. I know everything about punishment, but I don't know anything about love. And then this woman, a brave woman at the back got up and she said, you know, I'm on a healing journey. And for the first time in my life, I can say, I love you. I look in a mirror and I say, I love you. I couldn't say that before. I couldn't say that to my partner, my husband. I couldn't say it to my children because I don't know what love is. You see, when you're severed from your parents at that age and you're kept in these institutions for 10, 11, 14 years like myself, in three different schools. 
You lose your family bond and severed completely from your parents. I know my sisters and my brothers because they were there at the same place by name, but I do not know them as my brother or sister because of the fact that we were separated. So the schools were run by four main churches and they were contracted by the government. And the, it's interesting how they set up the schools because the prime minister of the, of the day said, we're gonna start this policy. And he sent two men out to go and find out how it should be done. And one man was sent to the United States to, because there was a boarding school here called, um, um, oh, escapes my mind now. It was the first um, um, a boarding school that was held. And then the other one went to France. So they came back, um, Carlisle, yes, thank you. Carlisle Indian School. The man that went to Carlisle said, you're gonna to have to take them away from their parents if you want to educate them. But the well, that fellow from the north of uh, France said you have to punish them because he went to the reform schools. So these two things, punishment and taking your children away from the parents was the basic indigenous or Indian residential school policy in Canada. When we started our work, there were still about 80,000 survivors um, uh, alive. And we asked them, uh, how should we do this? And they said, don't listen to anyone's story uh, unless there's a safety blanket around them. Make sure there's a health supporter, a mental health support, medical, cultural support, spiritual support. And then you can ask the person, what happened to you as a child? Because many instances they told us, I've been trying to hide this story for 50 years. 60 years I've been trying to hide this. My children and my family don't even know what happened to me as a child. I can't speak my language because the, the language, the culture, your family, your community were all assaulted by this policy. So many students, children lost their language. I didn't fortunately lose my language because my grandfather who raised me could only speak Cree. He didn't understand or speak English. He didn't write English. My grandmother likewise. So when I went to um, a residential school at the six years of age, um, I went through the same experience as the stories that I heard about. But I had a fortunate blessing that I had a, an out. I used to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and I don't know where I got this, but I found a flashlight and I would put my blankets over my bed so that when the bell rang at seven, just before it rang, I would pretend I was just getting up like everybody else. But with the flashlight, I was studying under the bed. And then on Friday nights, we used to have these movies, the big reels, they'd close it off the big um, playroom. And as soon as the lights went out, I snuck out with a pair of skates and I would go and practice and skate and skate and skate by myself in the dark. Sometimes somebody else would join me. And that's how I ran away from the abuse. I would run at night and go for a cry because of what was happening to me. But you know, in a sense, that was a blessing because I took a liking to hockey and eventually I played in 11 world championships in nine different countries. I swam in three different countries. I played baseball in three different countries um, because that's how I, I ran away from, from the abuse. So after these six and a half years of hearings, we asked ourselves, the three commissioners, uh, what did we learn? What were the 10 main teachings 
from this journey that we've just done. By the way, the courts had ordered it for five years, but then they ordered it for another year and a half because of the extensive studies uh, we had to do. One mandate they did not give us was what happened to the children that did not come home? Well, because it was not in the mandate, we decided we're gonna study because we were hearing about these children who didn't come home. So by the time we finished, we found 4,300 children had died in these schools. The families didn't know where they were buried, when they died, how they died. So in our tradition, they couldn't close off by ceremony and tradition, the death of a child to send a spirit child uh, a farewell on their journey, spirit journey. So this work continues and now it's over 6,000 names have been uh, children, uh, names have been discovered where they died and where they're buried so that the families now can at least put an end to the question, what happened to my child? I remember a woman talking to me and she said, the last thing I remember about my little girl is I was hanging on to her with both hands. A policeman took one hand away, a school principal took the other. And that's the last time I saw my little girl. Mr. Commissioner, you go find my child, she said. And then we heard about children being punished by their own punishments. Because as you know, uh, violence is a circle and they treated their children the way they were treated. Girls told us that our mom used to wake us up at three o'clock in the morning and make us wash the floor with a toothbrush. And we wondered why she always did that. And then one day she told us that's the way I grew up. That's what I was taught to do at three o'clock in the morning, the nuns would wake us up. We had to scrub the floor with a toothbrush. So with me, I think in a way it, it was uh, meant to be, uh, the way I was punished was with a hockey stick. I was punished like you go in a front rest position, they call it like you're gonna do a push up. And then a supervisor hit me over and over and over the head. I, and, and my back especially, right now I'm taking treatment because arthritis and uh, spinal injuries um, are now setting in, not only from the sports, from, but from the previous um, punishments, I'm sure. So these children that died, um, we did a book on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the names of the students we found, because we have to do ceremony. We had a four day ceremony where there was one grave that was found. We took 27 little bodies, little, little grave, graves from there with traditional ceremony. I chose to carry a seven year old, six year old boy because that's all that was marked on a box, six year old boy. So we took these children home to the community and we gave them a proper burial but it was a four day ceremony where the relatives could come and have feast and prayer and say goodbye to their, not goodbye, but uh, send off their child's spirit to the spirit world. So not only the abuse, but the loss of children. And then what happens to the parents when you take away their children from them like that? Many parents told us, that's when I went drinking. I couldn't take the pain of losing my child. I couldn't protect my child. So I went to drugs. I went to alcohol. I went to abuse. So one day a young lady said to us, what about us that came after? I didn't go to residential school, but my parents did. My grandparents did. And then that triggered us to, in our hearings, have special days just for children. 
We call them education days. Over 14,300 students came to the schools, to the hearings, I mean, to listen to survivors tell their stories. And one little girl in Montreal got up and she said, I'm angry. I'm very angry. How come I didn't learn about this history? I learned about everybody else in Canada and I didn't hear about this history. Why not? And that caused us to start having education days during the national events. And we had over 14,000 students come to the student days and listen to elders as to what happened to them. So it was not um, a good story in a sense of the truth. The court told us to go find out the truth of what happened and design a path to reconciliation. But I found very early that it's a spectrum. Yes, everyone has a right to know the truth. But secondly, when you're harmed like that, an apology is fitting. So the survivors demanded an apology from the prime minister on behalf of Canada. And he did apologize. In the United States, there was also an apology for the boarding schools. Unfortunately, it was hidden in the defense bill. So most Americans don't know about this history, just as in Canada. When we started, only less than 5% of the population knew about the residential school policy. When we were done, it was up to 69, 70%. So during the time of the national events, we informed Canada about their darkest, saddest, most unknown chapter in Canadian history of what happened to 150,000 children, many of them dying. So you see that consequence unraveling in our streets today with the addictions, the suicides, the murder and missing indigenous women and girls. When I raised that issue at the United Nations for the first time, we only had, and I know one is too many, but we only had 300 that were missing and murdered in Canada. Just as I finished my speech, a group of women from Mexico came to me through an interpreter and told me the same thing is happening to us. So now it's over 3,000, and that's been revealed by a public inquiry that we called for to find out how are these mur murders happening? Where are these little girls being captured and then taken away by foreigners? So this sad story Yes, it's the truth. Yes, that's what happened. I had, as a lawyer, I had to ask myself many times, now do I know the truth of what happened? And when a man said, you know, I had horses. I lived right by one of the schools. Little boys used to come and sneak over and play with my horses. But you know what else I saw? I saw children burying children. So when a child died at the school, it was the children that buried the child. So how do you then try to fix this harm that was done? How do you try to use education and the UN declaration to promote rec reconciliation? Because that's what we did. It was education that got us into this mess. And I call it a mess because I really believe it was education that would get us out of that mess. And I see that happening now. And I'm so encouraged that it's happening because we called for action. We made 94 calls to action on what Canada needs to do in different societies, different segments of society that, uh, um, were tar targeted to their industry, for example, if it's corporations. Look at your national corporate policies. What is there in there that will advance reconciliation? If it's not, there's nothing, then find out about the residential schools. Find out 
what happened and then design a national policy for your own company on how you can advance reconciliation. We did that with the academia, the universities, the colleges. There's, there's calls to action to the colleges and universities on how they need to promote reconciliation. One of which is to change your curriculum. Make sure that in your curriculum, the residential school story is being studied by the students. Make sure treaties are studied. Make sure the Crown and Indigenous relationship is studied in those schools. Make sure that uh, anti-racism is promoted in those schools. So now the schools from kindergarten to grade 12 at home, it's mandatory, mandatory that the um, um, schools teach these to, to the students. So it was interesting over a period of two years to begin seeing change in, in the youth, in the children, the students. In our community, we eventually took over our own school. The picture that you saw was the largest residential school at one time in Canada. Over 500 children were in there. There were Alberta and my province, which is a state for the United States, had the largest number of residential schools. So you would think that the harm, the largest amount of harm would have been done among our people in, in Alberta. So reconciliation is underway in the schools. The other thing we made as a call to action when I sat down with my colleagues and I said, we asked ourselves, what were the main teachings that we learned? The first principle of reconciliation is to use the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. The longest debated declaration in UN history it took us 27 years at the UN and 12 more at the, in New York to get it adopted. Four countries voted against it, Canada, United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Eventually, over a period of years, they changed their position. There were 144 countries that voted for the resolution to set up, to adopt the UN declaration. 11 abstentions and four said no. Eventually the 11 abstainers gradually changed to a yes. Eventually after years, the four no became a yes. And it's now the most widely uh, supported UN declaration in the world in terms of consensus. It has the largest consensus. So what do we do about this truth? What do we do about this harm? Well, it started in the schools. Let's begin that journey in the schools. Let's teach this story. Let's teach this story about what happens to children when they're taken away and they're put away like that. Their name's taken away. What happens to the parents and the children that come after? There is a path to reconciliation. And I'm, I'm blessed because of a city near me. It's, it's called uh, the mis most pronounced city in Canada. We, it's called Wetaskiwin. It's actually Wetaskiwin. It means, it's a Cree word that means having good relations. And we asked commissioners when we sat together and we asked each other, what does reconciliation mean? And we came up with three words. It's about restoring respectful relationships. It's about restoring respectful relationships. That's what reconciliation means. So universities and colleges are now teaching in the Faculty of Education about this history. In the Faculty of Law, the law societies, the foundation, the law foundations, the judges are starting to learn about this history. Because many times we're asked, how come you are the way you are? You're no good, you're lazy, you're a bum, you're a drunk. 
how come? And luckily in one court case called the Gladue case, the story came out that you should make the link of the accused to the residential school and find out why he did what he did. And then another court case recently actually uh, includes now uh, in the principles, first one called the Gladue principles, the judge can ask, is there a residential school history with the accused? Or the lawyer can raise that and say, Your Honor, there's residential school history behind the accused that you should know about and hear about. Now the judges are learning that as well in, in Canada. So the judicial community, the police, uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I'll be meeting with police officers because of the deep rooted racism that we've experienced recently, the systemic racism. So the academia, the private industry are beginning to do things. The sports industry, actually, actually the most active uh, advancement in reconciliation is through the sports teams. It's interesting uh, how that's happening, but they're advancing reconciliation in a good way. Could be done in physical education, for example, in schools. So we, we broke our report into themes. First of all, it's about the missing children. And then it's about education, the health. Uh, why is it that we have so much illness among our people? Then it's about um, spirituality because that was prohibited as well in residential schools. But the last one is reconciliation. So what are the principles, the 10 principles? By the way, the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, when they did a study on reparation, redress and reconciliation, actually said that um, we should have 10 international principles of reconciliation. So they took our 10 and changed them to be a global scope. So that now there's 10 principles of reconciliation uh, internationally that are beginning to find their way uh, uh, through society. The uh, language that was attacked in the sc schools uh, prevented um, we succeeded in establishing a language caucus at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which you heard about at the beginning. This language caucus, uh, we decided we should call for an international year for indigenous languages. And I had the honor of giving, giving the opening keynote uh, to that international year. But for the closing keynote, I spoke for 17 minutes in my language, not one word of English, because I wanted to welcome the next call we made, which is a decade for indigenous languages. And that'll start next year. So for the next 10 years, uh, I remember actually when I, I, uh, I was upset, very upset when the, the uh, decade was rejected the first time. I said one year of trying to revitalize and retain and maintain and strengthen our languages is not enough. We need at least a decade. For, for example, the World Conference on Racism, Against Racism. I gave the first keynote on that. Well, as you know, now there's four decades, the fourth decade against racism. So, We'll be speaking our languages for, for 10 years, or focusing on our languages. Those that can speak will relearn because they say culture is healing and language is a part of culture so that they're, they're beginning to learn their languages as well. So um, 
one man said, um, when we asked him, what is reconciliation to you? He said, give me my language back. We heard a woman say, you took my talk, meaning she had lost her language. And the man said, for me, reconciliation would be, you give me back my language. And it reminded me of um, and it's a situation we were at, and I'll close off with this story. Have you ever heard a language die? Have you ever heard a language die? I did. During one of the meetings, we had not begun our prayer, a meeting with a prayer. And um, the chairperson said, go and ask old man to say a prayer for us so we can begin this meeting. And he said, I'm very honored that he would ask me to say a prayer for us because I am the last living speaker of my language. So listen, listen very carefully to the sound of my voice as I speak my language. Listen to the sound of my language as I give thanksgiving. And he went on to pray. A month later, I got a phone call from someone and, and all he said was the old man died. I said, what old man? I said, remember the old man that died for, that prayed for us at the UN? He just died. So I heard a language die. And it was if like somebody just hit me right in the middle of my stomach when I heard that. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone. So when we have this decade, I ask you through your school systems, through your clubs in your societies, um, ask about our languages, help us revitalize our languages because it's, not, it's gonna be probably more than 10 years. When we took over our schools, our language had gone down to 9%. Only 9% of us could speak our language fluently. When we took over our schools and we made it Cree-based, treaty-based curriculum, uh, mandatory for the children to take, uh, to study the language, we're now back up to 15% already in two years. The chiefs in my community, the councilmen, they made a declaration that in our territory, Cree is the official language. In Canada, as you know, it's Canada's official languages, two of them, English and French. While we made ours, Cree will be the official language. So the children are beginning to learn that in schools. So that's how the reconciliation is unraveling through the schools, through our languages, through our languages and uh, uh, through our culture, returning back to our cultural ceremonies, to the songs that we sing. So with that, I'll stop here. I'm taking too much of your time, I apologize. I was going to uh, show you a PowerPoint, but it um, disappeared somehow. So uh, I hope that I can encourage you to do one thing, just one thing. Grab a book of, a, of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or, or look it up. Um, read the four to six articles, that's all there are. Grab a book of the 94 Calls to Action for Reconciliation, and read the 94 Calls. Listen to the one that speaks to you, and make a commitment to commit that. To, act on that, make a commitment to act on that reconciliation action, and then it'll spread even further and faster around the world. So thank you, and I apologize. I took so much of your time. I really, really am uh, uh, sorry about that. Chief Please, Please, Child, thank you so much. And believe me, no apology is remotely necessary as, as one of our guests uh, 
Elizabeth Morales has said in the chat, we thank Great Spirit for giving you the strength to speak and tell the truth. We thank you for bringing in the concept of love, which is something so undervalued at the best of times. And thank you for bringing in really the rationale of the United Nations, restoring 